Company. And uh, she is going to share with you opportunities, but also highlight some of the um, happenings in our current library. It is a top performing library. I don't want to steal too much <laughs> of her thunder, but the information she has to share is phenomenal. So without further ado, uh, Cindy. Welcome, Cindy. Thank you so much, Mayor and Council Members. It is a pleasure, as always, to speak before you again and just to highlight what a great partnership the Maricopa County Library District and the City of Goodyear really does have. And as you know, your community has embraced our tiny little library in all, with open arms. And that's why I wanted to share with you our mission and vision, because as we're moving through um, and involving throughout the county, we just recently redid these mission and vision statements. And the vision is that we are becoming that vibrant community porch meeting we are embedding into communities. And that's what our staff is being trained on currently in showing not only what library customers walking through the door can acquire, but community businesses, small business owners, workforce development. We know that it is a community hub and it is not just the four walls in which we embrace. So um, that is why I wanted to share that with you this evening. Um, these are our value statements and of course community again is front and center and we really do pride ourselves in ensuring that we are the integral part, meaning the community has a voice, the community is able to walk in through the doors and that we as the information specialists get back out there as well. So it's a switch from what library services have been in the past um, in, in um, response to the council members mem oh, question about digital access we're going to share some numbers with you, but it is definitely the venue of how libraries are changing. Um, we know it's a mobile society, and we know now with over almost 500,000 items that you already have access to being part of our system. So you can download all those audiobooks, ebooks, music, and video for free now on all your devices. And our small little facility now does one-on-one -on -one weekly sessions with people that all you need to do is walk in and say, can you spend some time with me and show me how to get this material on my e-reader? So that will continue in the new space, of course, that will be enhanced, as well as give us the opportunity to do programming for larger numbers in that capacity as well. These are some of the numbers that Nathan was talking to you about, and these are from fiscal year 12. So this is what ended, and this is just um, the number of materials under the GO category, and then the district numbers, a uh, district wide. As you know, if once you have a Maricopa County Library District library card, you can borrow any of our materials from any of our facilities. And of course, any of the digital items are free to access as well. Um, our small facility now is the number one place where people, your community has so embraced how to put something on hold and make sure we get it to you. So oftentimes you'll see more items on the hold shelf to get picked up that are actually on the shelves. And that's a good thing because that just goes to show you that it doesn't matter about the size of the space, it's the, the way that you, know, you are able to market the services and just provide a venue for people to know how to do it. Um, programming, again, our summer reading program participants for Just Good Year alone are there, as well as the number of youth programs that occurred and their attendance. So over 3,600 kids did attend one program or another throughout fiscal year 12. And then, of course, we have the, um, the um, I'm sorry the number of computers. There are currently six computers in the small space, and people are always amazed that there are six, but they are there. <laughs> we did fit them in. And of course, this new space will give us the opportunity to expand that as well. Um, the gate count through those small doors is unbelievable. Unbelievable. And um, it's amazing. So you should be very proud of how your community knows the value and how they are just so excited. Um, it's one of those instances where we, as we talk with the management team, I'm thinking, okay, well, we're going to have a larger space, and how are we going to facilitate that? And I know 
no doubt that there won't be a problem that I think we're going to have people at the doors before we actually have a book on the shelf. But that's a good thing. That's really exciting and we're so happy to be part of it. Um, and then, of course, you have the um, expenditures that we spent in um, fiscal year 12. Uh, obviously went up in 13 in our current fiscal year and we anticipate it will be close to a half a million with the new facility because you're going to see an increase in staffing. You're going to see an increase in programming and you're going to see um, an increase in collection, obviously. Any questions about those statistics? Sure. Joe? Um, just to just to read some of those numbers because I'm not sure everybody can read them Please. that's back there mm -hmm. and I'm not sure I'm seeing them correctly but is that 94,600 yes it is 600 people that's yes. how many people came through our library came through the doors came mm -hmm. through the doors mm -hmm. okay that's that's a that's a huge number <laughs> it is um, and there was another number that I found it was it the question was it your programs itself mm -hmm. um, and I'm not sure I quite read that alone but how many how, how many people participated in the programs that you had there at the library, account-wise, for, for a good year? Sure. So, you know, summer reading is kind of its own entity. Kids, um, we count them as registrants. So it's not as, uh, all they need to do is go online. And this year, of course, it's every age. It's from 0 to 100. So we just counted the 0 to 18-year-olds in this fiscal year, and that is, um, the number that participated. And that is really, you know, a phenomenal opportunity for children because we know of the early literacy push. We know how important it is to keep kids reading through the summer. And so the, uh, the, the really great um, end result is that when you end with, and you can thoroughly go through and complete the program, each child gets to pick a book of their own for their own personal library that gets delivered to their home and it's just you know it's it's the I think the best in the country and I'm excited to tell you that this year when it starts at the end of the month it will be the very first time that every single public library in the county will be participating in Maricopa County Library District is is um, supporting it financially hundred percent so you know, I think this is great. I, I have a, a two-year-old granddaughter that works on a Kindle, all right? Yes. She does the puzzles, but she works on a Kindle, and she's two. And the six-year-old loves to check out books and read. And to encourage that, you know, and if you can download it on the Kindle or anything electronic or even the hard copy, I think it's great, the expansion of the library. It's a long time in coming. And I know there's several of us, you know, almost all of us wanted this to happen. So I appreciate the effort that you do, and I appreciate, and I'm just amazed at the number of people, even with the size of our library, mm -hmm. you know, that, you know, that, that number, 94,000. Yeah. You know, we have 60,000 population, and we got 94,000 people going through our library. Exactly. So I just find that, you know, fascinating. Well, right now, um, in the small space, there are two preschool and one baby story times that, that happen every week, mm -hmm. which is terrific. And then there's uh, some outreach that goes to Australia Mountain, where a story time happens monthly. And of course, there's an adult monthly book discussion and the weekly one-on-one -on -one e reader instruction, which when you look at the size and you look at the size of the staff and what they are able to accomplish, it's phenomenal. It really is. And that's part of the community driving and the supporting and knowing that, you know, this is all wonderful. So it is great. Um, it's, it's phenomenal. Yeah. We're so excited. Another question? Sherry? I, I just had a question about the, the checking out online and, and just mm -hmm. if you'll educate me a little bit. Sure. Um, because my same thing, my kids, I mean, they're more technology advanced than I am. Do, are the kids given a different level of cards? Like you have the teen section and the children section. Are they given a different level so they can check out freely or just their parents? Yeah. No, they can check out freely unless the guardian who has to be present when a library card is issued sets parameters okay. that you don't want them to take out any kind of video. Then that's up to the, pr the parent to okay, make so that. Okay, so you just set those when you get the card. Exactly. The okay, thanks. Yes. And um, to elaborate a little bit on our digital access, we are part of the Greater Phoenix Digital um, Consortium. So we pull money with other municipalities, and of course the county is part of that. And so you have access to all of those items, and it's just, it's, it's incredible. It, it grows every day. And um, the great thing is that people aren't realizing is that those children and toddler books that are electronic are available through us for free. 
So it is just a matter, and there's so much after, you know, they're, they're, they, they are so good at using it. I mean, it's <laughs> those days when you took the book to the restaurant when you were taking your kids to eat are over, you know, you just hand them your Kindle and <laughs> they're happy campers. No, it's great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh, thank you, Mayor. One quick question. How many computers do you anticipate having at the new facility? Um, I believe it is, is it 12? We, we, the initial number was 12. We are working through those numbers uh, as part of the FF&E process. Um, so we're currently working on that schedule right now. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, you can see that we certainly are welcoming all of this. And we yes. really appreciate all your support in the past, the extension, the time it has taken us to move to a larger facility. Uh, and you can see the city, uh, well, it's, it's proved the city's behind this. So. <laughs> Absolutely. Mm -hmm. There was one more slide. I don't know if it'll work because it was, uh, yeah, it needed to actually, well, I don't know if I can bring it up. There we go. Just to show you that, oops. Is it going to let me do it? Yeah. <laughs> it is a matter of just having an increase in materials. Okay. And then, of course, that will affect the programming, which encompasses the entire community. So we are excited. If I can ever answer any questions, concerns, please don't hesitate. Thanks. That. You Thank bet. You. Thank you. Mayor and Council, just one more quick note. Uh, we truly have great partners with, with Maricopa County, um, but also the hard work of the Friends of the Library Group who, are, who have provided great advocacy um, throughout the years. And uh, uh, they are actually uh, doing fundraising efforts and are helping with some of the FF&E items within the library. So we're excited about that and want to thank them for their support as well. Wally, thank you. Thank you, because I know Wally's been very right. active in that. I know at the beginning I was active in it, then my schedule sort of took over <laughs> and I couldn't do it any longer. So we do appreciate them and that their continuance with it. Great. So great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll go to the second item, is an update in, on efforts related to the development of properties located in the West Goodyear Central Planning Area, and Bob Beckley will present. Bob? Thank you, Mayor and Council. Tonight, uh, I've asked Sarah Shilton to uh, join me up here because she's been the co-leader in, in this effort to negotiate these agreements. And uh, this, this effort really is uh, a spinoff of the uh, December council meeting. I think the, my predecessor, Jack Friedland, uh, discussed the growth model. And the growth model is really the, uh, the vehicle that was used to uh, make these uh, uh, amendments to the development agreements. Tonight, we're just going to discuss what the process has been, you know, how, where we're at today, the status of those agreements. And also, um, the, we expect that uh, one agreement, uh, La Jolla Vista may come to you next uh, Monday, but that's still dependent on timelines. We're getting pretty close to the deadlines here, and we may not be able to make that. But the, the remainder of the agreements will come before you on June 24th for your approval. So let me get started. Uh, the agenda that we have ton tonight is Just to provide a background of the West Goodyear properties, uh, the, how this uh, the history going back to 2005, the status of the development agreements uh, today, uh, the touch on the uh, highlights of the growth model and the agreement points that were have been negotiated, and the next steps. To refresh uh, everyone's memory here, if you don't know where West Goodyear development or uh, the planning area is. It's uh, bordered on uh, the south of Interstate 10, north of MC 85, east and west of Cotton Lane, kind of bisects the majority of it, and east of Perryville. Joanne? Uh, just quickly, when I was looking at the land use map, can you uh, refresh my memory of the um, dwelling units per acre for that area? It uh, is point eight. Uh, five. Okay. Do you want to? Um, I don't know that we have specifics. With this agreement, we originally gave a, a, bo a density bonus of 0.85 over the base base amount in the general plan. Um, but some of them have uh, higher densities because they provided other, you know, like extra. Um, 
mostly uh, green areas. Um, one had to provide a park, and so they're as high as 3.4 dwelling units per, per acre. So I don't think that we could say specifically without having all of them in front of us, it's not consistent. They all got a density bonus of 0.85 over the baseline bonus. Was the baseline, uh, well. Of two. Two, two to mm -hmm. four, okay, so it was two, and then you added point, okay. point eight five, and some went higher from that depending on kind of what they kicked in in terms of, uh, gave us in terms of development. Uh, but the 16 properties that we were looking at, they anticipated uh, 6,099 homes being developed in that area. Bill? I'm sorry, Bob, can you, um, my eyes are, I'm struggling. Can you give me those boundaries again, please? It would North is I-10, south is MC-85. And then uh, Cotton Lane, uh, it's, it bisects the, the, the southern portion of it. So it's east and west of Cotton Lane, and it's east of Perryville. Great, thanks. In 2005, 16 properties in the West Goodyear Planning, Central Plan area approached the city about the development at the time. It was tremendous growth uh, spurt occurring. The city had permitted 2,500 homes, uh, and in 2005, and it was anticipated that growth would continue. Uh, the city's population increased significantly in that period from 41,000 to almost 48,000 in 2006. The water consumption was increasing 40% from the previous years. And in addition to the new phases in the master plan communities, entirely new residential developments emerged throughout previously undeveloped areas of the city. The projected build out of the West Goodyear properties was approximately 6,000 homes. 20% of the pro projected homes were located outside the then city limits. The area that was currently served by the city uh, the area was not currently served by the cities and there, there was no plans to. The developers develop, uh, put together a contractual framework developing requires developers to prepay, prepay for all services and infrastructure. The development agreement required prepayments uh, for wastewater treatment ca capacity uh, to develop water uh, facilities, trunk lines, wastewater and water master plan studies, construct, equip, and operate a fire EMT station that would serve the West Goodyear properties. The prepayment was based on costs for capital, equipment, and operations. The total amount of the contributions for all 16 properties uh, was approximately $40,000, $40 million. Prepayment would then be credited against the impact fee when the permit was actually pulled. I'm just it, gonna interrupt here because while you tell this story, I, that was the first year I was on council. And that was an extraordinary agreement, 16 of them to come together, and the cooperation, collaboration they did on this. It, it, it was, I don't think we've ever seen anything quite so extraordinary to have that many developers come together. So just want a little sidebar. Thank you. Uh, in exchange for this agreement, the city would commence on expansion of the wastewater plant, construct a fire station to serve the particular area, grant a 0.85 dwelling unit per acre density bonus and administer the cost recovery ordinance. The city would also annex the properties that were outside the city boundaries and rezone for development. But due to the economic downturn, the development did not occur. Everything was shelved at the time. Where we're at today. Uh, yes, Mayor. Oh, I'm sorry, but I didn't see you. Did the development agreement go through though? Yes, uh, yes, it did. It was approved, right, sir? Yes. Yeah, the whole development yes. agreement went through. Yes. Just the the execution part of the document did not happen. No action occurred. So we, we had an MOU that was signed by all of the 16 property owners, and I and there was about two developers or two property owners that didn't enter into final. You need to come closer to the microphone. Sorry. Please. There was about two uh, developers or property owners that didn't enter into development agreements, but the rest of the group did. And the two that didn't were very small properties. One lost some of their property to the fire station site. We acquired part of it as a fire station site. So they're very small properties that, that actually didn't enter into development agreements as part of the original MOU. But all the big developers did enter into development agreements. Great, thank you. 
in November, last November, representatives from the West Goodyear Group approached the city to discuss the developing the area in the existing development agreements. Uh, the city had experienced a gradual upturn in the real estate market. Even with the downturn in the economy, the city anticipated growth uh, at a rate of approximately 2% through year 2013. Uh, the growth, therefore, would continue at a slightly more gradual rate. The city started to see positive signs in the housing market. It was uh, projected that the number of single-family permits in fiscal year 13 uh, is likely to be a little over a thousand units or about 51 percent higher than expected. Staff reviewed the projected number of homes in the West Goodyear as part of the city's growth trends model. Uh, Goodyear was no longer planned to bring on 6,000 homes at the rate that they projected back in 2005. The growth was uh, now estimated to be almost half of that 3,100 units um, that build out at 2005, and that's a result of less developments. Their originally, the original number of developments have been reduced to about uh, six or seven, seven, I believe, at this point. And uh, the big component is the staff uh, reevaluated the need for the developer to prepay for the infrastructure necessary to support this this uh, development as a result of the reduced growth projections and also the, the, in, the impact on existing facilities that were available. This slide I think you have seen before, it's the reiterative uh, growth trends model that uh, we have been using now. Uh, the first step the city takes on in working with development projects. It requires work from all city departments involving the development services, finance, legals, engineering, water resources, environmental services, and the city manager's office. The com main components are the growth projections from development services, the revenue estimates, and the cash flow model from finance, the water and wastewater infrastructure needs from environmental services, water resources, and engineering, and development agreements that are also a component of the model which uh, legal has been assisting with. The West Goodyear units were factored into the city's growth model and the projections and the total permits projected were through 2025 were cash flowed out to determine the impact fees that would be collected and the infrastructure needs were identified. It was determined through this process that the West Goodyear units could be served through development agrees, development fees collected at the time of permit, and that it was not necessary to collect prepayment of fees from the developer up front. The staff continues to update the model on a regular basis. Uh, multiple departments are still watching numbers and trends, and the model has indicated that the impact fee is increased, is an increase is necessary over the long term. City has contracted with a firm to prepare an impact fee study as an, and is involved in that process. The study will review and calculate new rates, recommend for council the adoption of new rates. The framework that uh, was developed for the amend, amended agreement consists of these high level points. The recent Council amendments to the subdivision rule regulations in December 2012 established timelines for the recording of construction and uh, platting. Plats must be recorded within 90 days of council approval and then within 90, 180 days uh, from the recorded date, construction must begin. For the properties that existed uh, previously with final, with that had uh, final plat approval, timelines for recordation have been established and they're generally about a year from the, the, t the date that the agreement will be amended, approved by council. And for those that fail to meet those timelines, there is an expiration date and those plats will no longer become valid and they'll lose their entitlement. Those terms have been incorporated in these, 
these, these agreements. The additional uh, points that uh, were, were included were the city will reserve the right to deny fu fu the future final plats if the city has, has d does not have the resources or facilities to serve those, those new developments. Uh, this doesn't commit the city to uh, any uh, uh, unlimited development in that area. Except for the per prepaid financial obligations already paid, Properties have no obligation to make future prepayments. That requirement has been uh, eliminated. Instead, the city will collect the development impact fee at the fees at the time of the building permit issuance. And the uh, trunk lines that were originally included in the development, the major lines, not the subdivision uh, facilities, are, are the responsible of the West Goodyear property owners. Other key points uh, within the proposed amendment include the development fee credits will be applied for the construction of utility lines and are included in the cost recovery ordinance. Uh, the, the credits that, the, that will be uh, refunded will be limited to the portion of the fees that will be attributable to the lines, so the, the sewers and the, 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 the uh, transport mains. The wastewater component of the impact fee will not be, and that will fund the, the facility, the exp expansion of our facility. And the properties will retain the density unit uh, of 0.85 um, bonus uh, as, as indicated previously. Next steps, uh, May 20th, hopefully, as I indicated, there. There will be uh, one development agreement coming before you for your consideration and approval. And the remaining agreements will be uh, brought on June 24th. The additional agreements will include Amber Meadows, Perdata, uh, La Pravada, uh, La Ventanas, uh, La Palmas, La Brisas, and Paseo Ridge. That's my presentation, I'd be happy to take any questions. Do I have any questions from council? Joe? Joe. Probably more for the attorney. Um, on the agreements that are coming for us, you feel comfortable <clears throat> from a city standpoint that there won't be additional burdens put on city resources? Well, I mean, there's gonna be additional burdens put on their resources, but staff has looked at all of this, and um, when we started this agreement way back when, it was we didn't have the capital to fund the improvements that were needed to, um, uh, to uh, we didn't have the capital or impact fees or the funding to, to fund the uh, construction of the re resources that we need, the facilities we needed to provide wa wastewater treatment or the wells, the, the well sites and things. Uh, since that time, we've increased our impact fees. I, I don't know, some of you guys would have been around back in 2005 when this was done, but our impact fees were incredibly low, too low, and that was part of our problem. We just didn't have that you know, support. We didn't have the financial support and the impact fees. We weren't building up the bank to do the next expansion. Um, Larry's looked at it, staff's looked at it. They believe that we have the water resources available <coughs> for those with the, for those uh, properties that um, have are already platted, because we're already committed to serve them anyway. Uh, certain of the plat pro properties don't have plats, they'll be coming in, and we've already looked at some of those, and staff is uh, convinced that we have the existing uh, capacity and that we have the money available through the impact fee accounts to do the treatment expansion plant that we need to do. Thank you. Bill? Kind of on that same note, Bob, we talked about this earlier today. Um, regarding the fire protection. Mm -hmm. um, that is a huge expense, I think, right behind water and wastewater. Uh, building of the fire station and then, more importantly, the ongoing expense of staffing it. Um, are we removing that entirely from the agreement or are we just gonna do that? Are we gonna build that, staff that through the impact fee? How, how's, that, how's that being managed? Well, normally uh, O&M isn't covered by impact fees ever. Um, originally when we did this, uh, as part of the 
2015 consideration for us to annex, we had required that an O&M contribution be paid to, to um, staff it. Um, there, and of course, we were going to build one, fa one facility and then staff it. At th that was going to serve the West Goodyear area. Um, my understanding is that this was provided to fire, um, and they thought they could serve it out of an existing facility until such time as a facility in West Goodyear and that West Goodyear planning area was constructed. Um, but yes, we'd be eliminating the um, O&M contribution in its entirety. And, and that is the obligation, that's the only obligation that's really being eliminated. The rest of it's timing as to when we, when we collected everything. If, if I could uh, add to that too. Uh, we looked at, uh, in fact, I asked the fire chief last week uh, when we were putting this together because he hadn't been involved in these discussions at least for the last month. I wanted to circle back with him to get his feedback on that question. And he had indicated that, uh, that yes, he was aware of the terms that were being negotiated and he was comfortable with that. They were aware that uh, the, uh, the anticipated growth rate uh, would not dramatically increase the uh, need for the new station in the, in the near term. So what uh, we're looking at is potentially looking at the call volumes and then in the event that the call, call volumes or the needs uh, that uh, come before the fire station in that area from the West uh, Goodyear area. Uh, if they reach a certain point, then there's certain phasing plans that can be put into effect. One would be add resources at a current station uh, in the area so that they'd be able to double back and devote more energies there. And then look at maybe a more, more of a frontier type station where they'd have a, lesser, a smaller staffing component. So there are provisions for a phased-in approach if the need arises, but there there is plans in the uh, impact fee analysis that I think it's out to 2020 at this point in time, dependent on the amount of growth throughout the city uh, to see when the appropriate time to bring on that uh, the permanent facility. Okay, the concern that I expressed to Bob earlier today was that we got as a city into a jam over the Pebble Creek Fire Station where we had done the exact same thing where we didn't plan for it and then it was needed and we had a heck of a time trying to get s money to staff it, uh, not to mention site it and yes. find a location yes. for it, et cetera. So okay. we at I least have that part. Problems <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we at least have that part nailed down with this, uh, w with this agreement. But what I'm concerned about is when we open a fire station, that is at least a million dollars of ongoing expenses every year. And if we look at the the trend of our budget over the last few years, that becomes a very scary, um, you know, thing to see, looking looking forward. Um, so that was the concern that I I expressed earlier. Um, and then the other the other issue um, is the general plan re has the two requirements in it. One that says the city shall achieve a four minute response time for the fire and medical related emergency services according to response standards established by the city. So we've already established a four minute response time. And then the city shall coordinate the funding and staffing of temporary stations to maintain the four minute response times within new development areas. So while we have this in our general plan, we're making decisions that go that are contrary to that. Now it doesn't mean we can't change it in the general plan update. And if we're, if we're not looking at it, perhaps we should be, because I think we've got a contradiction among ourselves of what, we've, what we say we're going to do and now what we're actually going to do. And it seems to me that we had talked about that four-minute response we time did. before, we and we talked about a, a study, and we yeah. talked about it, it really hasn't always been met. Is that correct? Because I remember the conversation. Mm -hmm. So in itself, that's the side of the house that we need to be right. looking at uh, in order to make good decisions on this fire station. I do like the idea that they're talking about a smaller add-on. It's more realistic. Now, I don't know what the cost, and it'd be interesting to see, is that is that cost effective or is it not cost effective? So, but, but I think, to me, if I'm thinking as a citizen, I want to know about that response time, and I want to know if, in fact, those are realistic numbers, uh, and, and does that need to be changed? And, and so I guess that's up to you. To make that happen, well, yeah, and that's all I'm doing is just kind of throwing it up there and, uh, and to to do the to look into it on the studies and I just remember we talked about that, so I guess no study was ever done or nothing. 
I'm looking at the fire chief. That's what I'm looking at. Oh, I think that's another board <laughs> I'm person. I'm looking at him because I don't know. I just remember the conversation that came before us, and we had a conversation on response times. And, and it was presented that, that, you know, we assumed everything was four minutes. It's not. Suggested. In, in the it's a goal. Good, good evening, Mayor. Sorry. Started talking about that. Saying hello. No. Um, in the uh, Sonoran Valley Public Safety Master Plan uh, that was done in 2008, it was a four minute and 59 second response time. Oh, so well, that's close. <laughs> yeah, it's it's more towards the, the five minutes. But that's something that we, we are constantly monitoring. But we're also making sure that that those data points are reflected um, equally throughout all city documents. So we want to make sure that there's no disparities between okay. city documents. So we're working with uh, Katie right now to make sure in the general plan that we'll get updated. Okay. Does that, does that help you on the, as far as, I mean, I understand your yeah, concern. Absolutely, and, and I, I think the, the development agreement part is, is good, but we're gonna be faced with an ongoing operating expense that was actually part of the deal to bring him into the city in the first place, which concerns me that there's not a provision in there. We've got water covered, we've got wastewater covered, uh, but the O&M part, at least to get started, we're gonna bear the full burden of that. and. And by moving forward, and, and I, um, I, guess, I guess I just at this point wish we had we had addressed that or at least uh, figured out some way to to get that that worked out. It's a small part of a much bigger plan. I think the overall and it, um, basically the overall agreement is good. Uh -huh. um, but developer contribution is what you're saying. But yeah, I, I, you know I don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater. I guess is where I'm going with this at this at this point. I saw here, uh, Vice Mayor, Joanne. Uh, switching gears, I'm putting my planning and zoning hat back on. And um, since we have all these partners uh, talking together and we're looking at a large swath of our land, um, in the big picture, when we look at um, the densities of areas and we look at our core areas and, and um, items for those, those pieces, I sit there thinking back to um, years ago we had a open space and trail system master plan where we as a city had, had said we wanted to have all subdivisions, all areas somehow, you know, going together with this trail system, uh, sidewalk system, whatever you want to call it, some kind of system. And so I just wanted to, to state that, you know, I would love to see that this was all connected somehow since we're looking at it um, holistically as this large, you know, area. And uh, uh, I, I would hope that that hasn't been lost, as we've said in, in the past. Sherry? I guess this just kind of follows up on Bill, and I, I don't know if the fire chief come, go. I don't know. <laughs> I was, I was Before you to get, get too far away, <laughs> um, what is the build out? When are we expecting this? at the 2% growth that we would need a fire station or we would need some of these other um, expenses? The, I don't think it's been defined on a basis of need, on a basis of funding. Uh, the, the finance department has put it in for 2020 at this point in time. That's where it's programmed at this today, as of today. So that's when the operating expenses would kick in, would be about just, I mean, best guess, we could have another boom yeah, and then we'd to throw build, everything so out. But 20, 20, 2021 is more than likely if at, it's built in 2020. Okay, at a conservative 2% rate of growth, that's about when we're looking. Okay. Molly? I have a question for Bob, please. Um, <coughs> I want to get to the bottom line. It's wonderful to get all of the background, but I mean, what are we talking about? We have, how many owners are we talking about that own 16 properties? We're Three, four, five, ten? Seven, seven different Seven, uh, seven of them, okay. And they want out of the MOU from 2005 that required them to pay $40 million up front. That's correct. Now, have is all they paid towards the 40 million is 85,000? I don't have the exact numbers with me, but there were a couple of the developers who um, were their projects were far enough along before the you know the crash hit that they had actually prepaid um, prepaid certain fees. Uh, Centex paid around two million dollars, 
and I think uh, Taylor Woodrow paid around $4 million uh, down there around Canyon Trails area in Las Brisas, but that's all very close. Uh, those properties are all close together. Um, so they have made certain prepayments because they were developing at that time. Uh, both of them have put in uh, substantial uh, amounts of the regional lines that are ne needed to serve some of the other areas. Um, if this development weren't to go forward, they would not be repaid for that or they risk losing, uh, risk not getting repaid for those regional lines because- So they want us to pay for their- No, they, for we, those have, lines? we have cost recovery uh, ordinances in place or cost recovery resolutions. So as the other developers come in and they tap into that line, they pay, pay their proportionate share. Okay. So one of the benefits of this agreement would be to get a lot of those regional lines in there that would support not just these areas, but so, some of the other areas in that, in that vicinity as well. And again, the only money that we're leaving on the table um, is the fire O and M. The rest of it's just an amount of timing as to when we collected it. We thought we had to collect it up front and then build the um, plant expansion. We, because of the slowdown, we have sufficient funds built up after we increased our impact fees. We have sufficient funds ha that have been built up and with the houses as they come on, we, sh we will be able to fund the next expansion needed for this area as it develops. Um, one of the things we did with the fire O and M was I mean, these houses were coming online so fast that we expected them to be built and occupied immediately. Which Are is they built? No. No, no. This no. Is so that was one of the reasons why we had the fire and fire O and M because we, you know, it was going to be such an immediate need. But um, you know, what the projections just don't support that we would have that kind of immediate need for the fire services that couldn't be handled uh, with the houses as they kind of trickle in now. All right. Now my question is this. Um, if we do do the MOU, are any of these um, property owners bound to pull their plots and start construction right away, or are they going to be yeah. holding it again for another five no. or six yeah. or ten years? No, that's what's, what's going to be the bottom line with this thing? That's one of the the points that we made with the developers because we've had these plats sitting out there forever, and it impairs our ability because of the kind of the paper water to plat other properties who are actually ready to pull. And so that was a big issue that we've had for a long time. And the am uh, amendments to the subdivision regulations changed that where if you don't record it within 90 days, it expires. That's right. Yeah. And, then, and then you actually have to start commencement of construction of the infrastructure improvement. So we were trying to move from a model of uh, platting as entitlement to plotting at, platting as development. So we've done that in the subdivision regulations and with these properties who are, you know, we currently have seven, but I think more of the properties, the 16 properties will come in and want this kind of deal too. They're going to be bound, if they don't have plats, they're going to be bound by the subdivision regulations as the plats are, are approved. So we know we're getting actual development. It's not just, you know, entitlement. For those who have plats, there's a deadline where if they're not recorded, um, like 11 months from the date this agreement is, is uh, approved, the plats will expire. And that's all of these seven owners of the Not all of them properties. have final plat approvals. Okay. The th I think three have, them three have final plat approval. And so if they don't record those plats within a certain amount of time and build the, um, build the infrastructure improvements, then their plats will expire. Then what about the other people? We the, can't force them to plat with the new regulation? What they'll do with the new, new development is they're, you know, they're intending to plat. They want to come in, and then when they plat, they'll be subject to the new subdivision regulations where they days. have to record okay. in 90 days. So okay. now when we see plats, you should see development shortly thereafter. Okay, great. And... Um, can we, before we actually vote on this, Bob, can we have another conversation about the fire protection part? Because even just a small station is going to cost us a lot of money, even if it's one truck and the crew. So, yes. thanks. Any other questions? Are we finished with this then? Did you want? Uh, no, we're done. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next item, 3.3, .3, is Dave Ramirez will present information on El Rio project, including historical background and recent discussion between staff and the property's agency partners regarding moving the project forward. I think I still have one of these old maps someplace in my office. 
you, talk about you have this a book about that thick? <laughs> well, all of us new know nothing oh, about this. Probably oh, no, I'm not saying that. No, I'm oh. saying, oh. y'all, y'all, we don't yeah, know anything about them. I saw the, the bridge, yeah. and that's it. <laughs> I drove over it. <laughs> yes, Dave. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, tonight, I'm here to give you a brief update for the, of the El Rio project. Um, the El Rio project's been around for uh, probably since the early 2000s. Um, it's been some time since you've heard an update because in the last five years there hasn't been a lot of activity, but it may be picking up next year and I uh, wanted to give you an update. So tonight, um, the major areas that I'll uh, cover would be the project location and the agency partners, uh, previous council actions, there was an El Rio water course master plan that was completed in 2006, followed a year, a year later by a memorandum of understanding. And here recently, uh, discussions have begun again with our partners in terms of possibly moving forward with a implementation and management plan. And then I'll cover what the next steps would be. The, uh, the project location is the El Rio. I'm sorry, the project location is the Gila River, and uh, it begins on the east end at the confluence with the Agua Fria near the Dysart Road alignment, and then it runs west approximately 17 and a half miles to the bridge on the uh, SR85 highway that connects Buckeye with uh, Gila Bend. The agency partners are Avondale, Town of Buckeye, Maricopa County, and ourselves. The previous council actions, as I mentioned, there was a water course master plan that began sometime around 2002 or 2003 and was completed in 2006. It was brought before council uh, in March of 2006 and it was adopted by the council. A little later I'll go into more detail in terms of what that covered. And then a year later, um, the memorandum of understanding between the agency partners was brought to council. Uh, for approval uh, in May of 2007. Both of these documents were also adopted and approved by our agency partners. Uh, the uh, purpose of the uh, Watercourse Master Plan was to examine the benefits, opportunities, impacts of a range of flood control management plans that address the following. And they're, they're fairly broad categories, but public safety in terms of flooding, the uh, social impact, which would be the community acceptance of the project, uh, multi-use opportunities, the aesthetics of the improvements, and then the compatibility with adjoining uh, land use. There were environmental considerations, biological and cultural complexity, uh, complexity of permitting, things like wildlife, uh, vegetation, and then some of the uh, some of the activities that were being proposed would require approvals from state and federal agencies. And then it looked at the, uh, at the economic uh, impact, which would be the cost to construct the project as well as to maintain the project. The, the elements of the, of the water course master plan include the following. The river mechanics, that's more of the technical engineering part, be the hydrology and the hydraulics of the ability of the river to carry um, stormwater. Uh, groundwater issues, uh, some areas of high groundwater uh, that could impact um, vegetation. Uh, environmental resources, um, physical and biological. Again, some of the um, requirements that would be uh, placed on the project as a result of, of, of wetlands uh, regulations. And, and the biological resources, more again, the wildlife and, and the uh, natural vegetation. It uh, consider, uh, considered the scenery, uh, which were the, the aesthetics, and then also the recreational potential. And then the overriding um, impact would be the ability to provide flood control. So the, um, the watercourse master plan was completed. Um, in it, it proposed several alternatives and an alternative would be, um, for example, would be a, what a cross section of the river would look like. Um, you took a slice through the, through the river. 
So it looked at several options. Uh, one was no, no, no action or leave as is. One was a non-structural and then three were structural. And, th and the difference between um, non-structural and structural, non-structural would be where you're not using um, um, hauled in materials such as rip rack to, um, to clad the, um, the banks of the, of, the, of the waterway to protect uh, you know, erosion. Whereas uh, structural, you, you depend more on the uh, just earthen fill to do that and you would manage erosion without, uh, without the, that feature. Uh, the structural alternatives would include um, cladding. And then uh, one thing that was looked at would be a kind of a soft, softer version of the structural, which would be the cladding, but then covered with uh, soil that could then be vegetated. So they, they looked at these alternatives and they evaluated, evaluated them through a criteria and they came up with a recommended alternative, which was a combination of um, soft structural and non-structural uh, features. This is a little hard to read, but this is out of the, the, re the final report, and this was uh, um, identified as the recommended alternative. Again, a combination of soft features as well as, as structural. So if you look at it, uh, this is probably looking um, to the east, and so, um, I've got larger versions that are easier to read. I'm going to refer to it so that I can also read it. Uh, over on the left, you'll see a, 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 an area. Uh, it's identified as lateral migration zone because in the course of, uh, of the, um, um, I guess the c course of, of a waterway carrying flooding, it's possible for the banks to, to shift. So they allowed for, uh, for some lateral migration of the, of the waterway. Then there's a floodway rid, uh, fringe, and uh, this is where you would want to keep development out of except for, uh, say, landscaping or uh, recreational type uses. The center, which would be the, the, flood, the floodway, which carries the, the flood during, um, during rain events. And then over on the right-hand side, um, on, uh, under, under the um, earth, there's a uh, bank armoring, which could be uh, riprap, either grouted or just in place to protect uh, erosion on that side. Also a landscape treatment and then a levee um, to um, conf uh, contain the, uh, uh, the floodway. And, and, and you'll also see there's uh, vegetation. There's um, some idea of uh, like equestrian and uh, also a pathway uh, for pedestrians and bike. So this was um, one of the major end results of the, um, of the water course master plan from 2006. Um, the, the approval of the, of the master plan also provided the city manager with the authority to uh, meet with and discuss with the other city managers and the uh, general manager of the flood control district to come up with a mem memorandum of understanding which would uh, kind of create a cooperative framework uh, to t determine how to implement the master plan. And the, the framework, um, it covered many things, but basically it consists, it, uh, the framework uh, identified four committees that would be set up, a, a steering committee which would which would address policy. Tip typically, it would be a, a, an elected member from each jurisdiction. Then an administrative committee, which would be the city manager or a DCM from each agency or general manager or assistant general manager from the flood control district. Then a technical committee um, of engineers, planners from each um, agency. And then a citizens advisory committee, which would include a residence uh, developers, property owners, special interests, uh, really um, others that would be um, interested in participating. The MOU did not create any financial obligations, it mainly created the framework. So that took us to uh, middle of 2007 and then I think at that time there was plans to move forward, however with the economic downturn it basically I was placed on hold until more recently um, uh, 
uh, discussions resumed at the uh, city manager level and the general manager flood control just to see if what the interest was in and moving on to the next step. I guess the next step was uh, considered um, coming up with an implementation and management plan. So there were some meetings and discussion and, and uh, I guess in, in summary, the, um, the next step would be to establish design and planning standards to be adopted by the partnering uh, jurisdictions. Again, to, you know, to provide public safety, to create the recreational development opportunities. Also to work with the private development side because uh, some of this, uh, quite a bit of the property is privately owned. So in order to move forward, there would have to be uh, involvement with uh, private li landowners and how to, um, how to integrate um, this plan with their development. Uh, create other economic opportunities and then provide for consistent implementation from, from one end to the other. Mm -hmm. uh, the next steps, um, in the uh, fiscal year 13-14 CIP budget, which, you've, um, which has been presented in a previous meeting, um, it includes a $50,000 uh, amount, which would be Goodyear's share of the consultant services uh, to move forward with developing this implementation and uh, management plan. So we're estimating about $200,000 to bring a consultant on board with each agency partner um, paying uh, one, one quarter of the cost, about $50,000. So that, that's currently shown in our, our uh, CIP budget for next year. Um, over the last few months, we've begun working with our partners in developing an IGA uh, which then potentially would lead to an RFQ for consultant services. The, I, the IGA, um, if it moves forward, um, it, would, it would not come before June 24th. Uh, that's kind of the target now. And what it would do, it would define the agency responsibilities, mainly in terms of uh, providing the $50,000 share by each agency. And, and then it would also discuss, there would be one agency selected to um, actually advertise the RFQ to um, to select a consultant to work on the project. Um, we'll bring more information uh, related to the IJ, hopefully on June 24th. Um, if there's any other information you would need, um, I'm open to any feedback that you can provide. Um, if, if it's approved on the 24th, then the next step would be to uh, fully define the scope of the RFQ and then move forward with the advertisement and selection and then uh, move forward with actually developing the, the uh, management or the implementation management plan. That's my presentation. Thank um, you. Open to any questions you may I think have. I see Bill has a question. <laughs> yeah, as soon as I pick up my mic, it's a dead giveaway. Um, David, do we have any idea, um, even roughly, what the overall scope dollar wise of this project is? Is this like $30 million? I and mean, what are we looking at? Uh, Mayor, Board, and Council Member Stipp, the, the figures that I've seen in some of the, co there were two COACs that came before Council in 06 and 07. I, I saw a figure of, of, the, uh, f of the flood protection aspects of it in the order of about um, 60 to $80 million for the entire reach from all 17 and a half miles. And then the, uh, the development of, of the uh, landscaping and recreational opportunities, uh, probably a little more than that, maybe in the $80 million range. On top of that, on top of that, so total yeah. somewhere 140, 150 million um, as of, um, I guess, uh, 2006 uh, time frame. So can, can you answer the idea that we're moving, not we the city, but this consortium of folks think that now's a really good time to move forward um, and bring a, a consultant on board? I'd hate to have this great plan and then be 200 million or 150 million dollars and say well this is a great dream but we've just you know we have it but we can't do anything with it is there, is there some rationale behind that I, I think we feel it's a good time because development is picking up again and there is so much property on either side that uh, that uh, is either um, and w which is in private hands some of which may may develop 
as uh, you know in this next uh, development cycle. So we thought it was important, not, not just in Goodyear, but Buckeye and and certain degree Avondale doesn't have a lot of property that it'd be good to have uh, some of these issues addressed in terms of how to not only uh, what you know what the project would look like, but even how to how to uh, bring the private development into the picture. Something like the city center thing that we did with Langford. I mean, uh, bring them in and have them be the catalyst. And is that am I drawing a close comparison? I think so because if not, then you know I think they'll they'll each develop uh, in kind of independently when there might not be or wouldn't be that consistency between developments or even between uh, between the jurisdictions. Okay, great, thanks, Jennifer. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I'm just going to it's look at it's look at the time now, so we'll answer a few questions, and okay. we have to start the other meeting at six. I want to give you at least a 10 minute break. All right, okay. go ahead. Uh, the private owners along all this. I don't even know if you can answer this question. It might be something for the consultant that comes on later, but are those ownerships in those areas really well documented? And the question, the reason I ask that question is, uh, there's a city that I go to quite often. They built this wonderful bridge. <laughs> they had to stop construction because it lands on private property, and this was not. I don't, I don't know how they missed doing this. It was one of the shovel-ready projects that we've seen in the last couple of years. So I just wanted to know, do we have a good accounting for where these private, you know, owners are along this project? Uh, Council Member Barber, we think we do. Actually, the Flood Control District has done a lot of research. They've, they've actually produced a map that shows all the parcels and, uh, and a list of ownership. So um, it probably needs to be, you know, checked. But I think we have quite a bit of information in terms of who the uh, owners are out there. Thank you. Sherry? I'll ask very quickly a couple questions. Um, is this going to have water running through it? It's hard to tell from, or is this going to just be more like the Indian school wash in um, Scottsdale or, or more like um, Tempe Town Lake? What, which are we talking more like in the end? Uh, Councilmember Loretano, I think it'll be kind of a combination of both. There'll, there'll definitely be water in, in, in storm events, but the, there won't be a, con I don't think there'll be necessarily a continuous stream, although there may be uh, for tailwater type flows, but there'll be, there'll be water features. There'll be impoundments where there'll be, um, there could be lakes. Probably not so much in the Goodyear area because of the air, uh, proximity to the airport, but further, um, well, over in Avondale on the Avondale side and then further west into, into Buckeye. Although we did talk about back then when they were talking about doing the, the I yeah, you know, the having, King's Ranch yeah, and, having and, the and doing the, uh, the city it. and all that up there. And they talked about flooding a certain area there, just kind of to the right of the, of the bridge when you go across. Uh, and, and that was that at that time that was part of the planning process. But it was going to be a big resort and combination of that's why I thought I remember for planning businesses up there and and. Uh, uh, so, yes, they had talked about water in it at that time. Well, so. I'd like it to be more like the lake when you look at all the development around that. So that's yeah, just... I'd like some water. But, uh, yeah, because water is what in the desert is... I'd like to see it in Goodyear, too, that port part. But, I'm sorry? Yeah, it's cold. <laughs> uh, but my other question is, this weekend there was in the Arizona Central, there was the trail map um, uh, for the trails. Will this also hook into the trails for Maricopa County as well when we're all done? Y yes, it will. It will. In fact, some of the cities are finished with some of those trails, right? Uh, Avondale has some, and so it would all connect, right? Yes, it would. Right. Okay. Any other questions? Well, what we're going to do, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to uh, adjourn this meeting, um, and we will have to have the last presentation, 3.4, um, presented after uh, our regular meeting. So I'm going to give you 15 minutes. Okay, so this meeting is adjourned and we'll readjourn at a regular meeting at 6 o'clock. So,